Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Ferranti. I am a manager for Music Man in South Florida. And I'm here today with Dr. Courtney Jones from Florida Atlantic University. And the topic of conversation today is how to improve your ability to audition, whether it's for all state, all districts, college, um, professionally, and just some topics to help people with auditioning. A um, little about us, my uh, background is I have a music education degree from the University of Delaware and 10 years experience as a high school band director as well as a private teacher. Um, been through a lot of auditioning throughout my life and I've prepared a lot of students to get ready for auditions as well. Um, Dr. Jones, how about yourself? All right, uh, first of all, good afternoon everybody. Thank you, Chris, for having me and thank you uh, to Music Man for allowing this interaction to happen. You know, I wish there you know, uh, was more of this from a, a plethora of things. But um, yes, so me, I have a BM uh, from Columbus State University, a MM from Shenandoah Conservatory, and my DMA from UCLA. And I taught high school for two years, and I uh, got in after that. I said I was good, and then finished my terminal degree, and then started teaching collegiately. Oh, I'm a poet and didn't know it. How cool. Nice. <laughs> so, um, this is intended for people, whether you're auditioning as a major or a non-major, um, and just the whole aspect of going through and some helpful hints and some maybe some tools that we'll talk about that'll help you get ready for those auditions. So um, starting it off, one of the first things is uh, your initial first impression. And um, unfortunately, one thing that you cannot control is how your judging panel's day has gone so far. If they decided to have a cup of coffee and the guy at Dunkin' Donuts you know, put too much cream into it. Those are things that you cannot control. So you can't worry about them. You don't want to worry about them. You should only worry about the stuff that you can control. And that is your personal audition, as well as your interview and how you present yourself in the audition. Um, walking into the audition, first impressions are crucial in my book. Um, it's the first thing they, they hear and they see. Um, Dr. Jones, what are some things that you look for uh, when you're on a panel from an auditioning person standpoint as soon as they walk in? So ultimately, I personally look for preparedness, right? Um, you know, every institution uh, will have a, a detailed sheet of logistics regarding what is to be prepared prior to coming into the room, right? That is the material that you practice outside of the room so that when you come into the room, you can execute the aforementioned. Um, and so that's the first thing that I, I, I look for right now. Um, you know, and then ultimately you want to make sure that you dress for the occasion. Now you don't have to come in, you know, wearing a business suit or, you know, whatever. Um, but you also don't want to come in, you know, looking like you just woke up out of bed. Right. So you have to find, I'll let you be the judge of that, right. In a professional situation, uh, situation, excuse me. But, um, but you want to come in and just execute what was needed on the, um, on the, the sheet, right? Whether it's scales or this etudes, whether it's a, solo, a prepared solo or excerpts, whether they're orchestral, wind band, jazz, or commercial, you know? So you want to make sure that you have everything in order so that you come in and have a successful audition. And again, and I like what you said, you know, you don't, you have no idea what the, the panel had gone through that morning and nor should you care. Right. Uh, so what your only goal, goal is to go in, win the audition to the best of your ability. Now, I don't know about you. I've had many auditions. Some were successful and some were not as successful, but they didn't stop me from not um, continuing those auditions because by going back to those auditions, I began to get better and better and better so that my nerves were no longer there. Um, and yes, you know, nerves are good. Those are good thing because it shows that you care. But the more that you do, the less nervous you become so that you can go in and execute a very well and prepared audition. Good. I know uh, when I used to have to get ready to audition, I used to get really nervous. Um, and some things that help calm me down is to know that I was presenting myself in a professional way. I know I like having a good haircut, so I always get my hair cut before an audition and that I'm nice and cleaned up, took a good shower. Um, but also what you eat before an audition is kind of crucial too, I think. Um, with me having stress, 
Um, me personally, I, you know, oatmeal, something that's going to absorb some of that stress that's inside of it. I mean, if you go out and have a bucket of wings before your audition, you think you're going to nail it, power to you. Um, me personally, I know my stomach wouldn't handle much of that. So as long as your nerves and your stomach are against you, you might have a rougher time getting through that audition or not. Um, and like you said, preparing for the audition, you know, getting the materials up front and knowing the differences. So uh, just talk to me about some of the things that you know when you've auditioned, um, the differences between having the works prescribed for you, for example, your scales and all those kinds of things, and knowing what's in the audition versus uh, having the opportunity to guide your audition and select the material. Um, what are some things that you, you find are helpful to, to know with that? Sure. So one of the things that you said, Chris, that I want to piggyback on is uh, knowing what to prepare before playing the audition, right? And you got to look at, I mean, I don't want to get too analytical about this, but it plays into uh, to factor. You got to know what time your audition is. Let's say your audition was today at one o'clock, right? So 14 days prior, you want to start preparing and playing that audition at one o'clock, right? If you, if you know that you have that audition at one o'clock or eight o'clock that morning or one o'clock that afternoon, you want to start preparing that audition at eight o'clock that morning, right? If that means that you got to get up at five, shower and eat or work and exercise, you don't want to have anything different so that when you prepare for that audition at one o'clock or 9 a.m., um, you already have gone through the process to get there. I personally don't eat breakfast um, in general. Uh, because I don't like to play with anything on my stomach other than maybe like um, a juice, you know, or something like that, just to get the blood sugar flowing or just water, you know, just to know that something's there. Because if you, if you eat before an audition and you don't know what your system is, you could p potentially be um, sabotaging your audition, you know. Um, I have yeah. colleagues of mine that have to eat before they play. I, I don't get it, you know, because as a performer, I move around on stage, you know, and things happen when you're a little bit nervous, right? The, the acidic acid in your stomach begins to, to, to spin up a little faster. And so if you have some food there and then it's digesting that food, then you might have an issue in the middle of playing a high C. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But again, you have to prepare yourself leading up to said audition. Um, and so that's one thing. So the second thing is, you know, depending on what institution has or what they ask you to play, some institutions or some uh, organizations will say, all right, this is what we want. We went eight to number two out of books, such and such, such, and here is the tempo, right? So when you're preparing, you make sure you have one of these. This is called a metronome, Chris. And for the viewers out there, this is an old school metronome. This metronome is older than me. And Chris is probably older than you. And I love <laughs> it um, because this is a, a truth serum, right? So you make sure that that etude is at that, uh, that tempo marking. And I would also like to suggest, even the etude or the excerpt, but I also like to suggest go 10 clicks above that tempo marking and 10 clicks slower um, that below that tempo marking because you may play something and it's perfect and that one of the members of the panel he sheer they may say okay that's very nice but could you also play it a little slower right or they might also say oh that's really good but could you also play it slightly faster with this articulation because they want to see yes that you've been prepared but they also want to see are you able to take direction as a potential principal player or a potential section player, right? So having that, that uh, ebb and flow when you're preparing that etude or that excerpt or that solo will allow you to have more colors in your audition, which will then, if they say that, then that's, that actually means like, oh, they're listening and they're like, oh, could, could you do this again, but at this tempo? Because now they're starting to see the, the work come into process, right? And at the same time, playing it at that, that tempo allows you to go in and execute it and walk out, right? Um, you know, so that's one of the things that I would suggest uh, is making sure that you follow to a T, okay? In addition, uh, you also may have uh, uh, ensembles or, you know, uh, an audition place to say, okay, we want an etude, right, from these specific books or books that are equivalent to this level or excerpts 
like these out of or the orchestral repertoire or the the wind band repertoire or the jazz or commercial repertoire, right? Or we want solos that are equivalent to these X, Y, and Z. So then it's up to you to go out and research, right? Um, that information, or it's up to you to say, hey, I have a question. Let me email this person, right? Excuse me, Dr. So-and-so or Professor So-and-so or judge a member So-and-so, what, what, what do you mean by this? And do you have a specific tempo um, so that I can prepare? And so you have to take all this into consideration before you walk in to that audition, because if not, you're unprepared and then you're wasting your time and you're wasting the time of the members on that panel. True. And I know that, you know, with, with auditions and etudes, um, some things that I usually tell my students and even just doing, you know, we'll talk about etudes here. Um, listening to those etudes is so crucial and everybody will tell you to do that. Um, I usually tell my students to find at least three different recordings of those because every human is going to play it just a little different. And some people are really apt to liking it one way or another. And I usually tell my students to take a, a total synthesis of all of what they've heard and make it their own. And that's what's going to make them a unique player um, inside of those recordings. Um, and then to piggyback off what you said for going slower or faster, totally true. It shows flexibility. Um, it, it shows that you know the excerpt and that you're not just regurgitating that uh, in one way to the panel and giving them an opportunity to say, all right, I'm a one trick pony and I can do more than just that at the same time. Um, as far as etudes and selecting the etudes um, for a opportunity to do that, I, I also usually tell my students too is um, show them what you can do and don't show them what you can't do. Because a lot of people, like you said, if you select something that's equivalent to the Haydn or to the, to the eBay or, or something like that, um, if you're going to try and shoot for the stars and you can't do it, you've just shot yourself in the foot again. So go in, show them what you can do and not what you can't do with the etude selection um, and, and do your research as well. Um, as far as another portion of the audition, I mean, we always talk scales and we could talk scales day in and day out with that and that kind of stuff. Um, what are some things that you usually see as a judge or you usually preach as a, uh, as a teacher to get your students ready for the scales portion, portions of your auditions? So I want everyone to listen very closely. Come up to the computer speaker, um, turn down anything else that's in your living quarter right now because what I'm about to tell you is, is vital information. Your scales are a part of your repertoire that you don't, you never stop learning. It's like taking a daily vitamin. It's like you need water to survive, right? Same thing with your scales. Just because you have your applied teacher um, or your, your director that says, okay, you need to learn these, these scales for this ensemble and then you're done. No, you always learn your scales and you continue to learn and improve your scales, okay? It's, 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 it's like utilizing the words in a sentence, you know? When you're trying to write a sentence and you wanna get rid of the, the jargon, you know? You don't wanna have a run-on sentence, but you wanna have the, the basic stuff to formulate a cohesive sentence. Because when you really, when it boils down to the, the nitty gritty, your ensemble pieces, your solo repertoire, your excerpts are based off of a diatonic scale. And the first thing that just comes to my mind is Shostakovich's Festive Overture, right? In E flat, that is your F major scale, contra D flat, your F major scale. But right? So it's based off of your, your diatonic scale. Now that's just one, but you have 11 more major scales and then if we're getting the minor you got three subsets of the minor scale which is 36 plus right so you gotta keep learning your scales so if you are a beginner student for example you know um one thing that i like to do like, yeah i can give you the holy grail and you should look at the holy grail right but it's like watching the movie uh what's um uh, uh indiana jones and the last crusades right 
choose the cop indiana you know <laughs> uh, that was like a Sean Connery, you know but um but it's 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 vital information but before i give you that you know i want you to understand how to approach it like if you i don't eat i don't eat meat anymore but if you had a a, a, a steak right a medium rare t-bone steak you're not going to necessarily give that to a two-month-old because they're going to gum it right and you're not necessarily going to give that to a seven a seven-year-old because they might eat it but they might shun it away you're going to wait on that steak right when that person um who can an, appreciate a medium rare steak right mm -hmm. it's the same concept of the scale so like for a beginner so if i have them learning their scales i like to teach it to them by rote at first right and then I'll give them the scale so they can read it because you also have to read your scale. So, for example, let's say the, you know, uh, F major scale, century on concert D flat. And so forth, right? So I will play it and they will play it. I will play, they will play. So that's, it does two things, right? They get to hear you articulate. They get to hear you play the scale. And they're also learning the scale at their pace. And the beautiful thing about it, you're doing with doing it with your best friend, Mr. Gnome. First name Metro, last name Gnome, right? So when they do it, <laughs> then they can begin to apply that to the other 11 scales, right? Now, each district, each state has their own a uh, way of playing these major scales. So when they finally get to understand it, then you can introduce them to the Arvin book or different books. Another book that I uh, teach my students with is a Slosberg book. So, um, you know, and, and then when they're at a level of, I don't know, fra at an undergrad, you know, we still learn our scales because you have a scale assessment for me every semester, right? Because before you leave my studio, you're going to learn how to execute all of your scales, right? Um, but there's a certain way to play them so that it is rooted and you can utilize these scales at a, a, a drop of a dime, right? And so that's one of the things that I, I, I kind of teach my students and not just my, uh, my beginner students, but also my undergrad so that you are prepared to uh, execute said scale and you don't have to think about it. Correct. And it's almost like a muscle memory at that point. Oh, absolutely. And some things that I, I usually sit down and tell my students is you got to understand it before you actually have to play it. I know I make my students look at a circle of fists. Then we have to say the notes up and down in half notes, nice and slow. We have to say it and finger along. And they're not allowed to play it until they can say it and fingering it forwards and backwards. And they understand it. And usually the first time they go to play that scale, it's pretty darn accurate. Um, how many times have we had students or even ourselves where you're like, all right, I need to play this skill, blah, 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 oh, wrong note, blah, 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 oh, wrong note again. Blah, 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 and, and then you're creating a, a repetition of falseness or wrong notes, and then you're actually practicing false things, and it's going into your repertoire. So that's something that you always, I always prefer to avoid so that we do it the right, the way, the right way the first time. Um, and, and let me interject, and I, and I appreciate that because when they come to me, then I have to break all those bad habits. Or mm. if you set a foundation like what you're doing, then when they come to me, then we can continue to build on that foundation. It's like building a house on sand. Yes, it'll work so much, but when you start adding weight, then it begins to topple. And so when you do the former versus the latter, um, in your original statement, and I have to break those bad habits, sometimes the student feels like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to do this. Well, well then, okay, then there's, there's a door, right? Because we don't need any more, any more mediocre musicians, right? Um, so listen to your teachers and instill those good habits so that when you come and you begin to execute said scale, then you have uh, the, 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 the knowledge and the vernacular to speak cohesively with a uh, consort of your own peers in the ensemble setting and also in your applied lesson. I didn't mean yeah. to interject, but I, that just, man, that, that, that you, you, you brought up a very good point. And even practicing scales. I mean, nobody likes to do it these days. And no, it's not that they don't want to do it. It's just because it's a tough thing to, to, to understand and get going if it's not taught the right way. Um, but there are many ways to practice scales. And like you said, every state has their own way to, to learn their scales. 
you know, some things I tell students too is, all right, let's spoon feed it. And I don't like using a piece of paper in front of them until they feel, com you know, we feel comfortable. They understand what the scale means with the whole and the half steps. Um, but also, you know, there are times where I say, okay, let's just make a quick solo off of the concert F scale. Da da, do da da, do da, and just make them solo randomly on just that scale and it helps practice it in another way. And also learning your scales in thirds, fourths, fifths, and manipulating that scale as much as you can, even playing it full range of the horn. Everybody usually tries to stay within certain octaves. If you understand a scale, it's really understanding a key in my book. And you understand how to play in the key of F or in the key of E flat. Um, and you can, you can sit with that and you're able to play full range or extended range in that key. Um, and yes, it's laborious. And yes, it's not the most fun in the world. Um, but once you do it, it opens up a whole new world to be able to make your repertoire easier to play and easier to manipulate. Um, and one thing that I know I've talked with a lot of people is, do you feel that when a student comes in for an audition, um, do they have the ability to play their scales musically? Sure. Um, and yeah, and everything that you do, it, and even with scales, you did say it, you know, it, scales can be monotonous, right? And not necessarily conducive to what we want to do, right? Because it's like we're going through the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. But when you have that applied teacher or you continue to listen to certain things and how to execute your scales in a musical way, then you're applying what they're asking you to do. Um, and so, you you know, when you're playing your scales, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, very rigid, but you can have ebb and flow. You can... Uh, a, you can uh, crescendo when you're doing the ascension and then decrescendo as you're doing, you know, um, your, your descending line so that there is some type of ex uh, ebb and flow and you're able to uh, uh, showcase your musicality, right? Um, you know, you had mentioned something about uh, um, obtaining range and playing scales, whether they are you know, one octave or two octaves. And sometimes you will have these auditions to say, we need two octave scales, X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z. And you probably say, well, I, I don't know if I'm able to do this or I can't, I can't play in an E concert D, um, you know, uh, major scale, um, you know, two octaves, you know, actually you can, um, you have to build on it, right? You know, and it's going back to that, that steak analogy. You have the full steak. You're not going to shove the whole thing in your mouth, right? You have to masticate your food. You have to chop it up and you have to eat it. It's the same process of learning your scales. And one of the books that I teach my students out of, um, and, you're, and I like when you say when you're saying you're singing, um, is I think it's the Clifford Lilia, the Lilia book. And in the process of that, it goes through the circle of fifths and it showcases how everything is interconnected. And, you know, if you're really hungry, you can do it in the circle of fourths and thirds or sixths you know, tritones, you know, um, but, uh, but it showcases like for that, that, that scale, you know, if you have the E major scale and you don't want to do dumb, ba 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 as you do that through your major scales, what you're actually doing is expanding your range diatonically and by step motion. Now, we don't have enough time to talk about that, um, but you know the, the pattern is there and then you realize, oh, I can actually hit that C now because now I can hit the D, then I can hit the E, then wait a minute, I'm going up to the high E flat. How is that possible? Because you're, you're chewing up the steak, you're cutting it in proportions that are easy for you to digest so that you can have the full meal. You understand? Yeah. And so, yeah. It's imperative to understand the approach of learning your scale while obtaining the range, you know, and you're not gonna get it that one semester, right? You know, you're not going to exceed your range that way. I mean, you could. Now, everybody is different, right? And that's the beautiful thing I like about teaching is that every student is at a different level and you meet them at that level. So many people say, well, you're going to learn this and the rest of you guys are going to learn this. Okay, that's great. But you're all going to learn this, but at a different time so that I can meet you where you are and help you exceed to where you need to go. Yeah. So I'm just going to plug in my laptop. I'm, I'm just going to disappear, but I still have it. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, some other things that come to my mind, and, and everybody always wants to figure out ways to make their scales better too, is um, I'm always a fan with modes and just playing the same scale, but starting on a different scale degree uh, and learning where to, to work your way around the instrument that way. There are tons of great teaching tools that uh, I've been exposed to, and there's probably even more that I don't know of. I know that in Dr. Jones's house back there, you see the good old Arbin's book, which is great for brass players. And then I also, uh, I'm a big fan of the Pairs Scales books, which is great for a lot of the woodwind players. Um, and being able to work those out, it's small little etudes in a certain key, um, gives you your majors and your minors, and it just goes around and, and toys around with it. And it takes that scale and just, gently tweaks it for you so that you can learn how to work in that. Um, and also just recording your scales. Put yourself under the gun. I mean, technology these days with an iPhone or an iPad is wonderful. And see if you can get through a nice, beautiful C scale in two octaves and see how it sounds on a recording. Put yourself, you know, under some heat. And then those microphones are going to tell you exactly what the judge is listening to. Um, so it's very, very crucial to make that happen. Um, we talked a little about etudes and stuff and, and, and stuff. Is there anything else that you think we need to talk on etudes before we move on? Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, you got to research, right? I mean, they, most institutions, if not all, will give you a list of what you need to prepare, right? And in that preparation, if you don't know, or if you don't have that uh, that magical accompaniment that plays 24 seven in your head. So when you see something, you automatically can accompany with it. So you can hear how to maybe formulate some type of musicality and, and phrasing and tapering of notes and ends of phrases and highs and lows. You know, if you don't have that, go research it. YouTube, the excerpt, YouTube where, you know, the, you know and like know where that comes in so when they ask you for this excerpt they ask of this excerpt you've listened to you know recordings to it right so that you can emulate what you've heard but don't just try to emulate it but also have a little bit of your own, your own flavor, your own. Make flavor. it your own, make it your own. Make it your own so that when the panel hears you, he, she, or they can understand, okay, yes, this person has done the work. Oh, and they, oh, they listened to that recording. Yeah, I know exactly which recording that is. That's such and such recording with this orchestra. And they're like, yeah, that's one of my favorites. How did you know? Well, obviously there's a reason why I'm sitting at this table. And then two, we can hear it in your sound because now you set yourself aside from everybody else in that audition right not only were you prepared you came in prepared uh musically you came in uh dressed to the occasion um and at the same time you piqued their interest so they can say ah what about such and such yeah I, such and such he this person was this but this person actually was listening and they 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 listened and paid attention to direction and you're stuck in their mind. You, you occupy space for free, rent free in their mind. So when they're making that ultimate decision or that final um, comparative decision, they can say, well, this person was able to listen. And I think that person uh, listened quite intuitively to our direction or their direction. Let's go for this person, you know, and obviously everyone has a different criteria of what they're looking for. But again, don't be a lemur, set yourself aside, but be able to have a foundation to sit upon so that when you execute said excerpt or solo or whatever you're playing etude, then you have an understanding of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a big, very big difference. Um, I know when I went to college, there was a, there was a opportunity to do the listening on a record, a tape and a CD at that point. Um, and even in today's life, having the technology available, there's a difference between active listening and passive listening to the excerpts that you're being asked to play. Um, I know that when I talk to my students and I, and I work with them, I say, okay, first what I want you to do is listen. No instrument, no nothing else. Have the music in front of you. Listen to see what this person is doing or what this orchestra or this band is doing. Where are the nuances? What's going on? Where's the phrasing? How is this being put together? Then what you do is after you've got it under your fingers, I'm a fan of just racking up the volume, get yourself a good set of speakers, play long. 
and get that vibe of what the Berlin Philharmonic is going to, how are that nuance is being created? And being able to show the judge like, hey, I've played along with an ensemble with it already. I know how to play it on my own. I've got my own nuances. I know where the phrasing's at. Who wouldn't want that person in their orchestra or band? And it's nice and simple to go. You're already part of the group and you have a little twist of your own to sprinkle into that ensemble. And it's so, it's so beneficial. I wish I, was, I wish I was younger. I said this to my wife the other day. You know, there are so many great things from technology that are available um, that it's so much more attainable to be a better person, a better musician these days than even when I was going through college and high school too. So it's like just pure, pure knowledge is attainable these days. So definitely. Um, one of the most scary portions of the, the audition is the unknown, the world of the unknown or the, the proverbial closet that you have to walk in, like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, which we all talk about in sight reading. Um, sight reading can make or break a person's audition because anybody can go and prepare their scales. Anybody can come in with the etudes done well. And when it comes to sight reading, I always know there's one person that, you know, they can come in and say, do you know your 100 charts? Do you know 100 songs? Do you know all that stuff? Once you get there, you start understanding. Um, what are some things that you teach and work on to improve your sight reading skills? So I like to um, introduce my students to what I like to call the mysterious envelope or the brown envelope. And what that basically is, is that, for example, my trumpet ensemble, you know, when we have our studio uh, each week, in addition to their lessons, they meet me with their lessons and we have our studio. Um, where we all play for one another and I give them a mini master class and you know we're learning but at the same time I give them whatever piece of music is in that brown envelope they have no idea what it is and they have to play it it can be very easy um, or it can be very difficult right you know inside the envelope you know we're trying to utilize a certain skill so if it's something that's very easy you know, we're looking on like whole notes and half notes, you know, we're looking on phrasing, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on, I want them to focus on how to phrase as a section, right? How to play in tune as a section, right? You know, and then they may see something that is like just completely and obnoxiously hard, right? So on that aspect, I want them to learn how to find a simple tempo, right? How to execute set syncopated rhythms, right? How to also stay in tune, um, how to listen for each other in that, right? Um, so that's the trumpet ensemble aspect, you know, and in our lessons, you know, I will have them, you know, obviously they'll warm up prior to coming in and X, Y, and Z. And the first thing we do, I like to do, um, you know, all right, I grab a book and I'll throw it up in the air at whatever page it lands on. That's what we will, uh, will, will play, you know, or I say pick a number between such and such and such and such and they'll pick a number, right? And then we read that duet, you know, um, as a freshman and then sophomore, you know, by the end of their freshman year, we're getting, depending on where they are, especially if they've done very well um, in their scales, then I introduce them to the C trumpet, you know, and then we begin transposition from B flat to C, you know? So they're reading the second semester in B flat transposing, and then we get into, you know, either the first semester of the second year or the second semester, and on the C trumpet, depending on their level of progress, obviously. And then we learn how to transpose, you know, uh, Caffarelli, you know, Bordoni, you know, and, um, and I'll say, okay, random throw. Now we're going to read this on this instrument in this key, right? They're like, oh, doc, come on, right? Because they're like, okay, so they're focusing so much on transposing, but at the same time, I'm making sure that they don't negate um, phrasing. They don't negate musicality you know so that they can incorporate that and i give it to them every day every day and sometimes it's a hit and sometimes it's a miss and sometimes it's a crash and burn but that's where you're supposed to do it in the studio so that when you are in the ensemble setting you know and they give you a piece of music you know or an audition setting okay can you play this sure bam and it's like okay what else because they've already gone through it right <laughs> One of the things that uh, solidified some of my, 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 um, my supplemental support in Los Angeles when I was doing a uh, film and television recording, I was doing this session and um, they, they had everything written out, you know, it was in B flat and the singer at the last moment, they said, oh man, um, you know, the singer wants it in this key. And I forget what it was. I think it was like an F and they wanted it in like, you know, A flat or something like that. 
um, or B flat or something. And, um, and they're like, oh, guys, man, I just, I, this just, it just hit it to us and we have to record this and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, cool. Let's just play it. Like, but I don't, I, I, it's going to take me a second to do the music. Give me like, you know, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Like, no, um, I can just read this and I can transpose it. Like, what? Yeah, it's, it'd be fine. Come on, let's do it. And like, what? You know, and some people are like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we can do this and such and such. You know, yeah, we'll just transpose. You don't have to write it. Oh, okay, cool. And them, you know, they were like, geez, oh, oh well, all right, good. That solidified me keeping my lights on for another seven years, you know, <laughs> uh, because my teachers would say, Mr. Jones, okay, play this and this key, go. And I used to hate transposition, like with a passion. And I don't like to use the word hate. Like I hate it, transposition. I used to fall on my face and fumble, you know, but it was, it was needed because during that process, I got better and better and better and better and better and better where it became second nature. It's like blinking and you don't think about blinking and or breathing until right now because you're thinking about yourself blinking and or breathing, right? It's the same concept of transposing. So I make sure that I give them information that they don't know when it's coming so that they're always alert. So when you go back to your original question, when you have that, that audition, they say, okay, sight read this, then you can quickly execute that sight reading. So that's mm -hmm. how I kind of help my students and how to help them build up toward that. I like all your ideas. They're, they're, everybody's got a way to tackle it in a different form. Um, you know, we all have the throw the book method and stuff. And literally the more charts you get into and the more things you sight read, you're making yourself better. Um, I always attribute sight reading success to also being just confident. Um, I always tell my students, play the wrong notes confidently because even when you're playing timidly, the right notes could sound like wrong notes at that point. So if you hit a wrong note, keep going. You can still wow them with articulations. You can wow them with dynamics and stuff. If you're fumbling through and you're stopping and starting all over the place, that makes your sight reading less, um, less important to the person that's listening to it. Um, getting sight reading materials. If you got somebody and you're, you're in a rough spot and stuff, I tell my students, good, take music, turn it upside down. Woo. Welcome. Now you got new music. All right. Let's sight read this. But, uh, you know, that note goes a little below. Good. What note is that? Because that note still exists. Take it up the octave. You're still practicing those sight reading excerpts. And being able to read that on the fly is just as important as being able to come in with an etude. Um, and pushing yourself, pushing yourself and reading things in different keys. Just like you had to transpose. I always remember my college professor, Todd Grove, saying, okay, next week, bring your tenor sax. Okay, bring my tenor sax. And he pulls out and he puts all the alto music in front of me. I'm like, you told me to put my tenor this week. He goes, yeah, we're transposing from, from tenor to alto music. I was like, oh, this is so not fair. And just, it, it's, it's wrong. It's mean. And like you said, everybody says, I hate this. Now, Deriving the word of where the hate and the distaste and the discomfort all comes from is the fact that it makes the person uncomfortable. But for anybody that likes to play their instrument, they love to play their instrument when they're confident, when they sound good, and when they are comfortable doing what they're doing, and they don't like doing stuff that makes them uncomfortable. So in your practice room, and when you're sitting down in a practice session, I always say, should you sound good in your practice session? And my students are like, oh, yes, you should always sound good in your practice assessment. So you are totally wrong. You should sound bad in your practice room frequently. And why is that? Well, that's because you're working on the stuff that you don't know. Work on your sight reading. Work on the stuff that you can't play. Do you want to be that one hit wonder and you only know one solo and that's the only thing you practice because you're afraid of what people are going to think when you walk by that practice room? And you're like, oh, my God, that person really is, isn't playing that well. That, you're playing for you. You're not playing for them. But when you start playing for you and you walk into an audition room and you know that you've gotten the work done and you're not afraid to play a wrong note, now we're getting some work done and we're able to push it to that next level. And we have all had, had those stories. And honestly, falling flat on your face and having that, you know, everything's burning on a sight reading excerpt, it happens. We've all been there. But the more you do it, the more sight reading that you look at, there's sight reading books that are out there. There's music that's out there. Um, you know, print it offline and get some of that stuff together and just learn as many songs as you can. And you can start 
pulling stuff from other excerpts that you can use in other excerpts to help you with certain rhythmic patterns and certain notes and just keep reading. And that's one of the best ways to work with sight reading, I think. Um, and even test yourself. Take a line of music, give yourself 30 seconds. Boom, 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 boom. All right, here we go and see how it goes. And then check yourself and record it as you do it as well too. And then check and see how well you think you did. Give yourself a grade, play a game. And I'll say, all right, I got an ice cream cone because I did a good, good sight read today in my practice session. And if you budget time in your practice time for sight reading, you know, everybody's practice time, whether they're getting ready for an audition or just getting ready for something, always take 10 to 15 minutes at the end, the beginning, and move it around your practice session too. Um, so that you're always sight reading something. And when you run out of more materials, find more materials. There's never an excuse that there's not enough music that's out there to sight read. And when you run out of all the materials on your instrument, good. Go find another instrument's worth of music. So if you play clarinet, find tenor sax music or trumpet music. Sight read that stuff. That'll help you learn what they're doing as well as open up your mind and being able to keep the, light, the lights on and the water flowing in your apartment, just like Dr. Jones was talking about with that. Um, another section to this is Unfortunately, we, we've had to explore the, the world of recording our auditions these days um, with coronavirus going around and stuff too. And a lot of students have marching band auditions um, for high school and for college as well, um, and things that they have to submit materials. What are some helpful key hints that you would say um, for recording a, an audition that needs to be sent in? Cool. So the first thing I would say, don't wait to the last minute. Mm. And I, and, I, and I said this earlier, don't waste the person's time and you and it, when you're when you're submitting this stuff, right? Make sure that you prepare for all this stuff prior, okay? So I want to say that do not wait to the last minute because that's being selfish and it's not needed. Secondly, um, test out your sound equipment, right? You know, uh, make sure that the things are working, make sure that the levels are correct, you know, that you're pointing in a certain direction or, you know, uh, the lights are off, the fan, not light, I'm sorry, the lights are on, but the fans are <laughs> off or any, you know, outside noises don't interfere. Like test it out, figure it out, you know, um, before you submit that final thing and do it a couple of times so that, okay, you know the parameters, you know what variables need to be put in place in order to do that. Okay, that's, that's the second. Third thing, is make sure that your angle is correct. Like you're recording, if it's a video recording, make sure that the video is set up correctly. You know, that you're in proximity distance from the, 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 the camera or the microphone or whatever, so that it looks somewhat professional in the shot, right? You know, um, you know and make sure it's in the same location. Uh, if you have to do uh, like one section and then you're tired, you know, and then you press pause and you go back if something because some people will allow that, you know, um, one full take and then you press pause and you come back and you finish, you know, make sure everything is placed so it looks like, you know, you're here all the time versus you have this one background, then next thing you know, you're in your garage, the next thing you know, you're like you're outside and next thing you know, you're like on the side of an alley somewhere like no, don't do that, right? Um, because it's not cute, secondly, and it looks bad. Okay. Um, fourthly, make sure that you are dressed appropriately for the video, okay? Again, making sure that the angles are right, that you have either a nice shirt. You don't have to wear, like I said, a suit, um, a three-piece or four-piece, a full regalia gown, you know, whatever. Um, and you also don't want to look like that you just rolled out of bed because that also showcases uh, two things. One, it shows how much you care about this or two, you don't never really thought about it. But then three, that um, you didn't take that in consideration that the person who has to go through all these videos and they come across this one video that looks like you're playing in bed or you're playing in this area. I mean, come on, like step it up. Okay, so you don't waste the person's time and your time's not wasted. And then two, uh, fifthly, I know I'm going through this whole, this whole, uh, this whole list. But well, so we're here. We're here to help people out. <laughs> right. Um, but the, and, and fifth and Poma, but you after learning the, the subsets of steps one through four and you have to do another video or an audition or whatever recording, you already know the steps that you need to take to make it happen. So then you already have that skill on your arsenal. Right. 
So make sure that you go through the process slowly so that when you present a recording um, to the committee or the panel or your future professor, that they have, you know, the, they can just take it and look at it and see, wow, this is good, okay? Now, there's a subset to number five uh, and all of this. So like category B, section 2-3.7, um, make sure you have a professional email, okay? Uh, when you send that, uh, don't put like, you know, Iron Man 27, blah, 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 or something, you know, derogatory, right? You know, you want to have a professional email, like your first name, last name, or, uh, you know, your initials and something, blah, 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 at Gmail or Yahoo or Google or whatever, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Whatever that the, the email is that you use, um, and you send that, that, the, that, the, that uh, professor or that panel. Also make sure that you have a professional header, you know, um, in the subject line. Don't put anything in like empty because let me tell you what, uh, and, I don't, and I don't care what, what a person feels about this. If your subject matter is empty, it automatically goes to my junk mailbox. Automatically goes to my junk mailbox because it filters it through. Make sure that you have, okay, uh, your name or uh, whatever uh, the title of your audition is and your instrument, whatever. And sometimes that's also given to you in the details, right? And your audition panel. Um, and also in that header, make sure that you professionally greet the panel. Dear Dr. So-and-so, dear Professor So-and-so, to whom it may concern, you know, um, if you don't have those names, because it allows you, again, you're building these professional skills. And at even, and, 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 and again, if I have something, yeah, so doc, or yeah, uh, such and such and such. So here's the thing, delete. Yeah. Because that's wasting my time. And that shows- Well, it's not a text message anymore. You know, it, it's, it's a, a professional message. document. Yeah. It is a professional document. And, you know, and again, you're preparing yourself uh, for uh, success and not failure because you don't want to waste the person's time. And at the same time, you're utilizing these skills to help forge your, uh, for your career into the business because we already have so many mediocre things. We don't need anything else that is mediocre, right? So be yeah. as professional as you can and uh, allow yourself the time to put something together so that when they like when I receive this, I have the header, I have the, uh, your professional email, I have Dear Dr. Jones, blah, 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 thank you for your consideration, all the best, blah, 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 whatever, you know, and get with your parents with this, you know, get with your private instructor, you know, say, hey, I have a question, how do I need to send this and listen to them, right? Yeah. This is for your benefit, okay? You're the one who, who is applying for this. That person's on the panel, they've already done the work, they've already went to the school. So you're the one that's coming into the game as, a, as someone who is freshly, you know, and who is new. So make yeah. sure that you, you go to this, these steps, and you take a, seri a serious approach to that, you know? And to, I like putting myself in that person's shoes, you know? They, they're going to be listening to the same recording hundreds of times. And certain things are going to start standing out. And if you want to stand out, there's two different ways to stand out, of being a rock star and you did it really, really well. Or on the other end, we're like, hey, look at this person. This was a total nightmare. Those are usually the things that, you know, when I'm on an auditioning panel, those are the things I'll talk about, the really good ones and the, wow, what happened here kind of things. All that mediocre stuff kind of just falls by the way. And we're back after some mild technical difficulties. Um, it happens, man. Hey, you know what? It's the best that we could do. Um, Speaking of technical difficulties, make sure that uh, you get some sort of a read receipt or something like that. Because even when you submit a really good audition, you say, hey, you know, just making sure you got it, all that kinds of stuff. Because how do you know that you could have sent a great, like maybe the best audition and all of a sudden it got stuck in cyberspace somewhere? You know, maybe you follow, hey, just following up, make sure you got my audition and you should be all good to go. It can't hurt to follow up. And also, one of the things that was sticking in my mind too is manners. And you touched upon it before talking about addressing these people. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, hey, to whom we can make consider and stuff. 
I'm always a big fan of using titles and Mr. and Mrs. and being as, 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 as polite as I physically can be so that that is the lasting impression. And it always brings me back to Austin Powers. You know, if somebody did their due diligence to have Dr. He goes, I didn't go to evil school to be called Mr. Evil. I went to evil school to be called Dr. Evil. You know, there are a lot of people out there that earned the doctor in front of that. So call them Dr. So-and-so, um, especially in a written format um, to make that happen. And they're like, hey, just call me so-and-so. Then that's their choice to do. Um, but always go for the formal. Um, and my rule of thumb is, is even if they're a day older than I am, Mr. and Mrs. always works very well. Instead of, hey, Bob, you know, dropping it down on you. Uh, enjoying that way too. Um, just simple things. Right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, and just to kind of end it off on that, well, in that one section off, you know, even in my syllabus, you know, I have it written out there. I mean, you know, this is, my name is, you know, Dr. Jones, blah, 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 blah. You can call me Dr. Jones, Doc, X, Y, and Z. Mainly it's just those two. You call me any or greet me anything other than that, or email me anything under that. Do understand then I'm the one that is going to give you your final grade. So you can choose the path that you want to go travel down to. But also in order to get, you know, I'm a firm believer of this as well. In order to get respect, you must first give respect, right? And I respect all of my students and they know that, you know, my, my studio is inclusive and it's, it's open door. Um, but, you know, you know, it's like you, you, you have to be able to say, you know, I ask my students, you know, if, if their name is Christopher, I'll ask them, okay, what do you prefer, Chris, or do you prefer Christopher, you know, because I want them to feel, you know, comfortable as well, you know, and then, um, you know, depending on, you know, where we are in our, our level of study, you know, I've known them well enough where they can call me Doc, you know, like the students call me Doc, you know, um, after they know me, you know, the new ones, you know, you know, until I say you call me Doc, you know, they'll call me, excuse me, Dr. Jones or blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, nah, just call me Doc. Okay, cool, because we build that relationship and um, that professional relationship. And sometimes I'll just change their name altogether, you know, where Chris then become Christopher then becomes Chris, then becomes Bone Crusher. Because now that's who you are. You are known from this day forth as Bone Crusher or Fingers McGee, you know, um, or something. Because, you know, and then it's just like, okay, we got it. No, but you have to build that level. And we always keep it professional, you know. Um, I remember when I was at UCLA and I, I played, um, I was very fortunate, and I'm still very fortunate, to have a mentor, Kenny Burrell, you know, the, the living uh, uh, legend, the living jazz legend who's played with Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, you know, um, all these people. And, you know, he would always say, hey, Courtney, call me, call me Kenny. I say, yes, sir, Mr. Real. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Kenny. Uh, oh, crap. And so for years, I would call him. He's like, Courtney, my name is Kenny. You know, can you call me Kenny? I say, sure. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Kenny. Burrell. Um, You know, <laughs> but I always say Burrell at the end, you know. But no, you're absolutely right on that because, you know, people have <clears throat> gone through that, you know. And some people, I remember some teachers, I call them by their first names, you know. Um, because they, they wanted to, wanted to do that, you know, but everyone has their own, you know, way of, of communicating. Is That's me. <laughs> no worries. Oh, oh, Nina, calm, calm down. <laughs> uh, you know, and everybody has their way of communication. So you're absolutely right on that, man. That is so yeah. true. So true. So we've talked about etudes. We've talked about scales. We've talked about recording. We've talked about interviewing. We've talked about permission, you know, just being polite and all that kinds of stuff. There's the last portion of this that unfortunately in today's day and age, that I think needs a little light to be shed on before we wrap all this up. And that's rejection. Um, I honestly feel that, you know, with today's social media and a lot of things, you're not going to, you're not going to win every audition. You are not going to be the person that they offer a million dollars every time you decide to play your instrument. And dealing with rejection is something that a lot of people love to turn to social media on. So my best recommendation um, to at least get started with is use the rejection to fuel your fire. If you didn't make the audition, find out why. And so I said, hey, I really appreciate you um, taking the time to listen to me play. Do you have any feedback that could help me get better for next time. And that's a humbling experience to be able to have somebody give you some criticisms 
take it to heart, use it to fuel the fire to make yourself better. And that's a tough inner thing that I know a lot of people aren't able to do. But in this day and age, as a musician, as an artist, as a, a, anything that anybody is uh, being judged upon a performance, you have to learn to knock yourself down, eat some crow, and be able to take that. Um, I know that some people I, can can throw it on the internet. Oh, this place was terrible. I didn't make the audition. Blah 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 blah. All that kind of stuff. Well, use it. I know that that's my biggest thing. I tell my students is use it to your advantage. Is there? Have you ever ever had an experience with somebody that has done that? No. Ah, I'm joking. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, you, listen, man. You know, not everything that that glitters is gold, right? <laughs> And not everything that is good is good is good for you in particular, right? And you know, uh, rejection. I've I've definitely had my fair share of that. Um, and I used to feel some sort of way about that, especially as a younger student. Um, you know, when I didn't get the principal spot, um, or I didn't get this competition, or I didn't get first place in this. I got second or third, or didn't place at all. You know, and uh, my ego would get into the matter of that, right? And we have, you know, Freud talks about the id, the ego, and the superego, right? The identity, the ego of who we are, and the superego of those of this God or conspirator uh, complex, right? And so when we put those, when those things are out of balance, that's when conceitedness comes into play, right? When you bring those things in the balance and you find the fine line of confidence and then conceitedness, right? So there's a fine line of that. And you have to understand how everything works together because it's a trifecta, right? And everything we do is psycho, uh, cyclical. So every, it's psychosomatic. So everything we do, it turns into something that's very tangible. So you have to understand that what, you may not get the gig now. And that is okay because there might be something better for you, right? It is not, it's not our understanding. It's not our job to understand why we didn't get it or or what would have could what what could have done be done better, right? Woulda coulda shouldas, right? Sometimes when you have those uh, those auditions, you know, um, you can ask for feedback, constructive criticism, and sometimes they will provide that, and sometimes they will say no, we don't do that, and sometimes they don't even respond back. Don't take it personally. You can't. You can't take everything personally. Because when you begin to take it personally, then you know uh, your 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 body is out of whack. Now, outside of the conceptual ideology, there's a thing that I teach my students called PIE: physical, intellectual, and emotional connotations that we have as creative beings. Now, I'm not going to sit here and talk about this because obviously these people who are listening are not in my studio. Um, but this is a subset that comes that I teach my students that comes from my grandmother. You know. Um, and there are other philosophical components about that that uh, my students understand that we can adhere to. But what I uh, but I'll just leave it at that. But um, but what I'm saying is that don't hold don't let it just just attach to you like a leech, right? Um, or a, a, a burr. You like when you're walking through you know an open field and you come back home and you see like these little burrs that are stuck to you, right? You have to hold it. I mean, sorry, you have to let it go. Let it pass through you. Don't hold it. Feel that pain. Cry. Get upset. Sure. Okay. Understand why and then move on so that it would allow you to prepare for the next one. Okay. Because you're going to get more rejection letters than you have, uh, than, you know, acceptance letters, you know, um, and I personally still keep my rejection letters, whether they're jobs, whether they're auditions or emails. That, that you have, everybody's a critic, right? And um, where, you know, they say, well, let me tell you why this didn't work for you and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I can look at this as two ways. I can take it personally, or I can look at it logistically, right? Um, unless this person is Hills and Dumbscum, you know, who wrote uh, the Jazz Pedagogy book or Witten Marcellus or X, Y, and Z, who, or this person who was sitting on this Grammy recorded label who has, who has won this Grammy and X, Y, and Z, I don't know, or who have received their PhD or X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And my particular field or focusing on this one particular subject in regards to extended technique, unless it's that person in the ear, out the ear, who cares? Because they don't matter. All it is is words. Because they matter this much. 
right? Unless somebody who is in our field, who looks out for our best interests and say, hey, I saw your recital and um, I thought you did very well. You know, I, I think and I saw that you were upset about certain things. Listen, man, don't let, you know, they, they can finagle it away and you're like, you know, by such and such. And then they know, all right, so check this out. Even though you might've did this, think about this next time, right? Or think about this as you go in so that you can prepare. And you're like, you know what, you're right. Because now they're offering you constructive criticism, but they're also doing it from a place of where? Love, it's the third, it's the third chakra, it's the heart chakra. They're offering it to you from a place of love and you will receive it from a place of love versus that individual who really doesn't matter because all they do is sit behind their desk and type whatever, or they just come to a random concert and they're like, well, let me tell you how it's a bill and blah, blah, blah. But last time I checked, you know, you, you're nowhere in our profession. Matter of fact, the, the job that you do do uh, has nothing to do with the creative arts, has nothing to do with education and go back to crunching numbers. Not saying that crunching numbers is bad because, you know, my minor is in business marketing and management as well because crunching numbers is very important. But you get what I'm saying, right? I'm using this as a euphemism, right? So don't let it affect you and don't let it sit in your heart. <clears throat> Let it pass through you, feel that pain, feel the anger. I remember uh, I thought, and it might be better than when you think it is, right? I remember my master's uh, recital, my, my first master's recital, uh, because my, my teacher, you know, I try to do all my recitals and shows by memory um, because I like to have that audience engages and I require my students to memorize one piece on their recital um, because I, there is, there's a, phil a, a philosophy that I feel that this thing it is a barrier like not necessarily this but this the stand you know and sometimes this and then everything it's a barrier from those who have come to your recital who or your performance and they want to see something so remove the barrier and allow them to have this musical conversation but that is a conversation at a later time chris um but um what i have them do is 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 play and let them experience that Right. So I had this thing where I thought it was the worst recital ever, like ever, 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 ever. <sighs> right. And um, I, I was in a very, very bad place. OK. And, you know, and all my friends were like, well, where's, you know, where's Courtney? Where's he at? Blah, blah. You know, my buddy, I wasn't answering my phone calls and my buddy showed up to my place and I was not in a good spot you know, and we sat there and my friends came over. They came over, like my buddies came over. They left the place that they actually, you know, uh, were gonna surprise me for, you know, but then they came over and we talked it out and they were there, you know, and we all had a thing. And then when I went back and listened to the recording, it was like two mistakes and they weren't major mistakes. I'm like, come on, man. And I was freaking myself out because I cared so much so much for a quote unquote perfect recital, right? You know, and then talking to my mentors and talking to my teacher who was a former principal of the president's own and my, my dear friend and colleague to this day, I can call it any time, day or night, right? And then, and he just looked at me uh, and like this, and he's like, now that you're calm, you're not thinking about it. Do now, do you understand why I said it was not as bad as you thought it was? and you went back and listened to recording. Yes, and that was a learning experience. So I learned from that. So when I came to that again, you know, uh, situation, I was like, oh, I know exactly what it was. Or in the moment, I know what I did, move on. Because it's the music, it's the communication. So yes. don't hold on to it, let it pass through you, accept it, feel it, and move forward. Because the yeah. longer that you hold on to that, the longer that it sits into your, your, your chakra, the, the longer that it begins to grow. And then now it's anger. And anger leads to hate. Lead, hate gives you focus, focus, <laughs> stronger, right? <laughs> and it um, leads to the dark side, right? <laughs> yeah, that is not always a bad thing. It's yeah. <laughs> Jedi, Sith. <laughs> right? But yeah, but you get what I'm saying. So let it pass through you and learn from it, okay? Yeah. And even with the thing that we say pass through you, I would even say for me, when I would talk to my students, pass through you, but put a filter on and catch the good stuff out of it and filter it and keep some stuff for yourself that you can use as that's the positives, you know, with every, with every negative, there is a positive somewhere. Sure. Um, 
So just to wrap some things up, I hope that these, all these words of wisdom and all this stuff was beneficial. As um, I know students in Florida are getting ready for Allstate auditions, all that stuff was dropped this past week um, and, and doing that. And um, I know me personally, I'm always out there to help as many people as possible. Um, so if you ever have any questions about this stuff, uh, my email address is kris at musicmaninc.com. Um, you know, throw me some information. Uh, the company is on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and I know, Dr. Jones, if you want to, if you have any information you want to put out there, you can. Sure. So, I mean, if, if there are some questions, I know we, I know we covered uh, a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, you know, and probably some of you stopped clicking after the first three seconds, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if you're still here, thank you. And I appreciate you. And that means something because that means that you wanted to know what do I have to do to get to the next, to get to the next level. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you have any questions that uh, you wanted me to expand upon, shoot me an email. You can go to my website, which is cjonestrumpet.com. Um, or you can go to the FAU website. Uh, my email is listed under there. Uh, Courtney Jones at FAU.edu. And um, I can, I can uh, talk with you about certain things and try to help answer whatever or make clear what was discussed, right? In addition, on the website, on my personal website, my active website, you know, I have a page called the FAU Studio. I mean, there's like my active stuff, my, my blog, my, you know, <clears throat> recording projects, you know, um, you know, and all that other stuff. But there's a page there that says FAU Studio. And it talks about a little, you know, it's kind of like condensed version um, about what we just spoke about. Right. And especially, you know, like if you're auditioning for the FAU studio, what I expect to hear from an incoming freshman. Right. Um, what do I expect to hear from a graduate student? Right. Or what I expect to hear from a transfer student, you know, not like, OK, well, I want to transfer and I want to play this. No, you've already shot yourself in the foot, because if you didn't take the time to research what that school is asking for, and you're submitting that material, then that already gave me an unconscious bias that I try not to have. But uh, it's like, well, then you didn't prepare. Again, you were ill-prepared and you were underprepared to provide a body of information for said studio, right? So all that stuff is there. You can research me on that. Um, or I'm also on Instagram as well. You know, I have my creative outlet on Instagram is cjonestpt where I do, um, you know, performances like, you know, the Mancini Quartets, which is another project that I'm doing during the staycation, or, you know, certain video things that I do with colleagues of mine just to stay creative outside of my professional career, you know, as a university professor and, and uh, international national chamber and soloist um, and an artist and whatnot. So yeah, yeah. that's how you can- And even- uh... Con Selmer has some great stuff on their website. They've got a wonderful education department for Con Selmer, for Vincent Bach, um, and those things too. So uh, they've got Dr. Tim Lassenheiser on there for motivation. And I know this is time for ways to be able to talk to students for drum major auditions and stuff. So they've got some wonderful tools on their website as well for Con Selmer instruments too. So uh, yeah, as always, uh, good luck to all the, the people auditioning, whether you're auditioning just to get into the next band for next year, or you're auditioning for all state, you're trying to get into high school, trying to get into school of the arts or going for college or just doing marching band and stuff too. Um, knock them dead. You know, everybody's here to support you and everybody's always here to offer you some information to help you get better. So thank you very much, Dr. Jones. I really appreciate you taking the time, sir. And thank you, Chris. And thank you to music man for allowing us to have this platform because especially during this time, it's needed. And no one's really going anywhere, right? Um, not yet, per se, but, you know, we, but we will return to the road to normalcy, you know? And so uh, in the process of that, stay in it, stay in the woodshed, and then come out better than what you were when you were going in. So I appreciate you guys for allowing me to contribute any way that I can. And um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. All right, take care. Thank you.